So we're going to talk about the head again, because it's a fun topic, important topic. And if you've been with me long enough in this series, we talked about what I call the LTL. And that's just a way of getting box logic onto something that's organic, in this case, the head. So we're going to look at the center line of the face, the eyebrow line, that's a T, and this is LTLs in no particular order. The uh, part down the middle of the hair or the long axis of the skull, there is an upside down L. And then the eyebrow line over to the ear, and the ear might be a little lower, a little higher. Um, in, in her case, in Eve's case, it's a little lower. But seeing those, now we have the length, the width, and the depth two different ways. Now, if we just did two planes, and not, notice we have one, two, three. If we just did two planes, plane two and plane three, that would also get the idea across, kind of. We're not completely sure of that because we could be on top or we could be uh, an inside corner, of course, of, of some structure, like a book kind of thing. But uh, we get the idea. Usually two is enough. But as you start to get more and more extreme perspective, you want to get all three L's when you can see them. And particularly, we want to feel the top of the skull. And you can see in the reference I chose, we can see the top of her skull. So if I draw a simple sailboat shape, and then get the eyebrow line and the center line. And notice when I'm doing these, or maybe not notice, but think about when I, you're doing these, comparing it to a grid. So is the, hor is the eyebrow line horizontal or is it tilted a little bit? In this case, it's tilted. It drops down to her left eye socket here. And then look at the center line of the face, not the nose sticking out. That oftentimes fools us but right down to the, maybe the philtrum or the, the uh, little divot in the uh, chin. And there we would see that actually it needs to be much more vertical this way. And once we have that eyebrow line, bangs, if she had bangs, she's got her hair combed to the side, the um, hair line, if we could see it underneath that sweep of hair, say the widow's peak that a Dracula cartoon might have, the eye line, the tip of the nose, the mouth, if we could see it, and the chin. They'll all track in that same box logic. And so will the skull. It'll go back this way, one way or another, and again, kind of compare it. Going back, and you can use kind of the part down the corner of the head there. Kind of look for that, and you can fuss around with that a little bit, and then put on this backside. But when you put that backside on, again, if we think of it as the top of the box, when you do that backside, make sure it's in alignment with the front side. So it needs to adjust, doesn't it? Doesn't have to be perfect. We'll add the shape of the hair on that later. But we get that. So if I can get the top of the head and the side of the head and the front of the face all working in relationship, now I'm going to feel real solid boxiness. We're going to get one, two, and three different planes. Now they'll be very nuanced particular planes. Lots of stuff may be on them, like there is on the front of the face, but it will give us that box logic. And then everything kind of works off that, and then we can play some of our strategies of um, eye socket, the zigzag down from forehead to cheekbone down to the chin and stuff. Now, when we get underneath of it, then, we want to be able to have the same thinking. We wanted to get some of the top of the box when we were on top of it, because that's that third plane. 
And then we want to get some of the bottom of the box if we're underneath of it, because that's also now the only visible third plate. So I'll get rid of that, do that. And the simplest way to do that and it's pretty simple, is get the laying of the head and the features and the structure, the anatomy, the eye socket or the construction lines of the features, whatever it is. Do it rather refined or do it um, fairly simple, big, simple shapes. And then just make sure you show a little bit of this. And the easiest way, as I've been leading you here, is just to show a little bit of the underside of the jaw or the hanging, the waddle, hanging of the neck separate, and unless it's an upside down head, below the jaw. The jaw would be right here. Here's that simple mask of the face. Simplified mask of the face, sideburn area, jawline, or more chiseled jawline, whichever. And we just don't want to do this off the chin and the neck. Now sometimes if you're on top of it that's going to happen but then you have the top of the head to give us that third plane. So if we're straight on or a little underneath or a lot underneath we're going to see some of this below this line, this jaw line. That's what we want. So simply start that line at or it can even be a little below and in this case, the shading, the shadow shape shows that. And now we have a chunk of structure, a chunk of shadow below the jaw and separate from the jaw. So again, it can be either the construction line of that mask of the face, or it can be the core shadow as we have here of the jaw, side of the jaw, underside of the jaw, the digastric plane, it's called, not that it matters. And in either case, we're, we're getting a little, let me clean that up a little bit. We're getting a nice clean separation right away. And then that gives us a feeling that it, there's a volume there, even if it's a sliver, and it's not one of those cheap Halloween masks that just cuts off here and has no no real structure, just lays over your head. So watch for that. And then if we're in a, a, a deeper perspective than that, then we're going to look for that box logic. The front plane axis, construction lines, is going to be at a different pitch, different angle. Then the side plane. So now we'll notice that the eyebrow is a little higher here and a little lower here. Bit of a pitch. And notice those aren't exactly right. So you can take the time to get them exactly right, but they're organic. They'll evolve a little bit with with uh, detail, the corners will round and things. So if it's not exactly right, it's not necessarily a disaster. And you could always move that eyebrow up a little higher later and move the whole cheekbone up as long as you haven't rendered out an eye or something. So those things, sometimes if there's a little error, 
it's not a big deal. Uh, and if it's a little error and it is a big deal, it's usually somewhat easy to fix. So take your pick. You can be more careful. Sometimes I want to be much more precise. Sometimes I just want the spirit of it's relatively high or relatively lower and not quite as fussy about it, getting it exactly right. So that sits in there. And then notice this goes this way. Again, doesn't have to be exactly right necessarily. But if I round that top of the, not just do this, but make it a little chisel, like it's a wood carving, then I may round off. I may sand down that corner later, but show those corners and that's gonna give us a sense of being underneath it maybe as we work our way down to the, to the where the nose is and such. And then everything will track that way. And we'll, we'll learn someday how to do that. But the will be also, again, doesn't have to be perfectly right, just close. We'll be underneath that jaw, underneath that face, and the shadow shape, and the construction lines, and the contours, in some way will suggest that. And that includes, again, we'll have to learn how to do this, the nose. Notice all the dark tones sit under here. nostrils within that. And we have the underside of that nose. And as the nose turns back against the cheek, it gets darker. As the cheek and jaw turn back against the ear, it gets darker in the same manner. And you'll have this repetition of, of how the uh, shadows happen based on turning down or turning back towards the left. But each of these things starts to turn in the right perspective. <clears throat> and the more I can honor that in all the big things and eventually all the little things, probably the more successful my drawing. So notice the eyelashes, the lower lid after it comes off that corner of the eye. Lower lid is tracking that same pitch down. Uh, if I could see it, the other eyelash would be showing up as well. Let's pretend there's a little bit of a eye showing. It's a little much, but just so you get the idea. So. Once we get that big stuff down, then we can learn to align all the little stuff. Again, that's out of place, but just to give you the idea, the eyelashes don't have to be perfect, but you can, you go back to your construction lines, you can make them perfect, but just generally falling down to a large degree. You don't want them way off, but a little off, one way or the other is okay. Okay, so that's, kind of the strategy there. We're really after, when we wanna show strong structure, and as we get into deeper perspective, we wanna show not just two planes,
just LT, but that extra L gives us a third plane, in this case, the bottom plane. Now the problem we're gonna have when we get into more severe perspective is that when we're on top, that head is nice and thick. You know, if we think of the head as an egg, the fat part of the chicken egg is on top and the skinny part of the chicken egg is down below as it tapers down from wide cheekbones to skinny chin. So this bottom plane is going to get very narrow and that could easily make the whole head look really narrow and stretch. So we have to be careful about that. So let's see what happens there with the few minutes we have to work with it. So I'm going to do that same construction idea. I'm going to compare it to a horizontal, compare it to a vertical. It's going not along the nose. Nose is going out this way. I'm going to look for how it moves back this way, and specifically where the eyebrows uh, come to the towards the center and the nose begins. That's that nexus of the T. And then down where the lower lip structure ends and the chin begins. So there to there. But notice it's on a curve and the forehead actually looks pretty vertical. And then it sweeps back strongly because it's going back to that skinnier and so in that sense, weaker chin. So it's moving that way. I'm just going to draw that. If I thought of a bucket, I get that underneathness nicely visualized. And so if I then go to the center line, eyebrow line, center line, eyebrow line, her ear is a little lower. I make, uh, unless I'm doing a portrait, I idealize and move them up to that eyebrow line, just like it that way. There's a zigzag. Notice if I painted a zigzag on this, if I came straight down with my paint, it would just be straight like the contours are. But if I cut over into a zigzag, it wouldn't do that. It'd be going over the curvature of the tube. So the eye socket forehead, bottom of the forehead, top of the cheek, would do that. Rolls that way. This is going to, in strong lighting, directional lighting, it might go into shadows, we learned, learned before. This is the uh, narrow front plane of the forehead. There's that same construction line. Like so. Doing that. Using the nose. The barrel of the mouth. And the chin. And there's that digastric plane. Now if we do that, I've just done this to it. Just pulled it back. So we have to think of this bucket again. 
And I think of it as a bucket with a barrel, a beveled bottom because notice how complicated this is. We really have to take our time. The digastric plane goes back and down, but the jaw goes back and up. Diabetic gastric plane into the throat, back and up. This way. So if we made it a box or a tube, bucket, wouldn't do that, it's going this way. Would do that. So I'm going to feel underneath this this way. We'll feel that in there, like so underneath. Now it's still not going to be completely satisfying, but we're just going to leave it there for the moment. So I don't want you to think about too many things. It's a lot. Now we're starting to get not really as satisfying as the reference, but we're starting to get that idea down. And we just want to play with that for a while because it's a lot. Like I said, it's a lot of things to think about. So let's do it again. Let's just draw that same thing. I'm just going to do that. I'm going to do the eyebrow to the ear, or since I'm thinking of it as a thinking of it as a bucket, eyebrow to the ear. And you can drop that lower as hers is, or you can keep it higher as a stylization as I've done. There's the eye socket. Now all I care about with the nose really is to feel how long it is. And I'll just keep adjusting it until I feel like I got the right length and I'm not going to worry too much about it because I just can't do everything. I'm just going to mark it off and I'm not marking it off yet because it's just too hard. I'm just marking it off flat. If I was underneath that and it was kind of a conical shape, it'd be going this way. I'd be underneath this would all be bottom plane with the nostril in here, which is what's happening. I'm not going to work that hard right now. And notice this could be a square, boxier version of the same thing. And whatever this is doing is exactly what this far eye socket is shown by that little bit of eyebrow. And what you'll find is when you're this kind of chiseled and boxy, and structural, it'll tend to look a little male. So you'll need to maybe change, fix that a little bit in the, in the refinement stage. But we're not worried about that. That's too much to worry about. We'll let it be a little too male. We'll let it be a little off. I just want to get the overall idea of it. Just marking this stuff down. And then I'm going to find that underside of the bucket going back this way going back this way I just do that now as soon as I start doing that let's do it one more time notice how I repeat and then pay attention to one more thing each time until I start to get the idea in a more refined way. I might want to do the simplified hairline. Instead of marking the eye socket, that might be too much. Instead of doing this to the nose and the lips and maybe the eyes, that might be too little because that's suggesting 
it's flat when we know it's round, 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 round. So I'm going to do those construction lines dropping down this way. So here's the, well, the upper lid's going all over the place. I'll use the lower lid. There's the lower lid, same direction as the eyebrow line. Just so you can see it, here's the upper lid in there. Here's the nose, just as it attaches across the front of the mouth, not as it sticks out as a wedge. Here's the mouth, the front section of the lip or the shadow under the lower lip. In there. And then we've got the jaw. And this comes back like the nose comes back. But I'm not interested in that, although I can draw it if I want. I'm interested in this underneath. So now that's starting to track a little bit better. Each of these I can think of as a boxier idea, front of the box, side of the box, or as a rounded idea, front of the tubular idea, like so. Still not going to be completely satisfying, but I'm going to be really patient on this stuff. Sometimes at these stages, I'll put in, whoops, put in a little bit of the shadow shape, especially when it hits a corner, as they tend to do like that, the corner where the underside of the jaw meets the front, the face, the front side of the face, like so. And if I come back and look for these construction lines a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, sometimes that makes for a more nuanced idea. Still won't be totally satisfying. I can add some of the secondary stuff, but it's getting there. So look how far we've come just being patient. We've kind of thought through the problem. We tried to get it basically laid in like we would in a flat perspective drawing, as most of us do when we begin, and then it, it flattens everything here and here and looks, we don't feel going around. So we start to add strategies for the corner of the face, which is that zigzagging eye socket down to the chin that we've talked about on several different occasions. That separates the structure. And then we start aligning the structure like it's tied to the front plane when it's on the front plane and the side plane when it's on the side plane. So now all the front plane things or a couple of the front plane things were kind of going in the same direction for a front plane, for a box logic. to separate that information and eventually render it in such a way that we feel it turn into the paper and into the canvas. And then we took it a little bit farther and started to more carefully align things on the front axis opposed to the side axis, front axis opposed to the side axis. And it can be done like a box, but it can also be done like a bucket or an egg for that matter. But it's still not feeling right and that's because we haven't paid any attention or very, very little attention maybe to proportion. Now, if you get way crazy with the proportions and screw it up, the way I have on the forehead, for example, and a little bit on the jaw, it's gonna look so weird you won't know if it's right or not. So you might need to pay attention a little bit to proportion as we were thinking about at different times here. But 
I don't try and dial in the proportion. A C minus is okay. A D plus is okay for now. It's just too many things to juggle. So I'll come back as I get more comfortable and I'll deal with the proportion on top of those box and bucket concepts. And oftentimes I'll begin proportions just going from the top down. Now I'm going to think of this as a bucket, but I haven't drawn the body and I may never draw the body in this little exercise. It's, um, dust that back a little bit. So what I'm going to do then is be a little more careful and I'm going to draw this thing still not super precise but I'm going to assume that what I do here and what I do here and how long I go down here are all wrong. I won't trust them. I'll test them. So I'm going to start from the top now and I'm going to lay in the information and I ideally would have each of these side by side or the old pages out so I can see the progression of my thinking as I get to this new level of understanding and refinement. And I'm going to make that a little stronger here. I'm going to draw that forehead down. I'm going to compare it to a grid. And that is, you can see against the edge of the screen, very vertical there, isn't it? And then as it goes up under the hairline, very vertical there. As it goes up into the hairline, it cuts back. And then here's the hair, just so you can see it. So we have a little bit of context there. Let's even do this. Just so we have a little bit of a value change. There and get, get that sense of that vertical. This is what uh, fresco painters would do. They would grid out their drawing like this and then they'd do a bigger version of the grid up on the Sistine Chapel. And then they would find the little how the forehead bumps within the gridded square on the paper and up on the fresco wall. And we'll leave out those there. And now I'm going to do my eyebrow line, but I'm going to do it compared to the top. And if something's foreshortened, it visually, not physically, visually gets shorter. It looks shorter. So we get a tube standing up. It might look this tall. We get a tube, that same tube coming strongly at us. It might look, you know, 40% of that. So foreshortened things, things that go back into the paper or the canvas get visually shorter. That means we will draw them physically shorter long axis lines. I'm not going to draw it this long, even though that's exactly what it is. I'm only going to draw it this long. So that means if I screw this up, I would much rather screw it up by making it too short because that's the idea of perspective going back into the picture plane is it gets physically shorter from what we saw it in the flatter perspective. So if I'm going to screw it up, I'd rather get that forehead a little too close to the eyebrow line. A little too close. And then like a box or like a tube. Drop the ear a little bit. 
I'll lay that in. I won't trust that either because I only have one way to compare it. I want to have two or three ways to compare it to make sure it's right. That nose goes off in this direction, but I have no idea how long it is yet. So oftentimes I'll do my construction lines way too long because that'll remind me that it's wrong. And then I'll come back and check it later. And then I'll just start working my way down. Now everything is going to go this way. So I'll come, that's the T on the box of our LTL. So once I've got that, I know the top front face of the box is doing that. I know the bottom front face is doing that. I know the side planes are going to follow some version of going back there, a little higher, a little lower, give or take, quite a bit higher for the jaw. But the front plane will follow. So I'll come back here and try and get that. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly right, remember, although you might want to make it that. And I oftentimes do, I usually do actually, I usually make it exactly right. And then I'll lay in those other things as we go and we'll, we'll kind of rush through this now. Now notice if I do this construction line here, if I can get some of the features, the construction or the contour to track in the same way, that's a very good thing. That keeps us from doing this kind of thing that's flat. That's what little kids and primitive artists do. We don't want that. We want to move down. So this deep perspective is just devilishly difficult, but it's also our best friend because things go in radically different directions. All the features that are on the front of the face, which is all the features except the ear, they're going to move in that exact same perspective angle. We can pick that up. And now if I drop this lower lid down this way, come over here with our reference, I notice that gets me pretty close to the bottom of the nose. The bottom of the nose is just a little bit longer than that. And I'll just shade that so you can see it. And that'll get me awful close, give or take how well I did these other things, place the eye and that kind of stuff. If it doesn't, it looks a little bit like a turned up Peter Pan nose, then maybe, and it's what I did, the eyes are a little too big, they're not close enough to the eyebrow line or hair of the eyebrow. I'll make adjustments to it and then I'll make it a little bit longer, but we'll just leave that there. And then we won't do all the features all the way down, but I'll find where the bottom is here. And I can just swing on down and find it. Or what's safer is to come back to my construction lines and say, okay, upper lip, front of the upper lip, how close is that? Very close, actually, before it takes off. Not quite that close. Line of the lips, lower lip, chin, and work on down. And I go little bit by little bit. And notice again, it's not completely satisfying, but it's a lot better than it was. So I fix one, one challenge at a time. I don't try, try and do it all at once. It's just going to be super frustrating. And it's just going to end up wrong. Now this is still wrong, but it's closer to right than it was three drawings back. So do I have the attention span? Do I have the curiosity? Do 
But I have the love of the craft, which is, is repetition. The reps, as they say in the gym. The repetition of doing the same thing again and again. Exactly the same thing, but hopefully slightly better. And when that happens, there's... It's just going to take another drawing or another six drawings and it will be way better or exactly what it needs to be. And I'll get there. And one of the things I'll do is I'll, as I start to get these things closer and closer to true, I'll lay in smaller and smaller details. Not because it's important at all, but if I get a little bit of the cheekbone here, then I can see that the jaw should be a little closer than I had it and a little higher than I had it. And the ear then needs to adjust a little bit. And then I can re refine the hairline or whatever. And I start getting closer and closer and closer to these things. And check it. And each of these things I would do in a brand new drawing, but we're out of time, so I'm going to rush it. Laying those things in and making correction after correction. A little closer, a little farther, a little closer, a little farther. Make Think of that a little squarer than it really is. So I can get that front plane alignment that was missing the last time. Even the sweeping bangs, I'll try and find, whoops, that's not it. Try and find that same axle change. I guess it was it. Like so, and then we ease towards, ease towards. And it's all based on a real simple sailboat that then we tilt one way or the other to get that third plane. In this case, that sailboat becomes a bucket. And the bottom of the sailboat is going to have a beveled bottom to the bucket, kind of like a, uh, a uh, knight in shining armor, the slits and such. So now what was this becomes this. We can feel that underneathness that is so critical for feeling the volume and the truth of what's going on there. And we just keep refining. Curiosity and patience, repetition and immersion. It's the only way you're going to get good at the difficult things. And this is a difficult thing. So if you're not going to be willing to cut yourself a break, and you're not going to be able to stay curious. And either one, that's okay. I just don't want to spend the time doing what I consider as bad drawings so that six or 12 drawings later, it's pretty good. Just not cut out for that. That's okay. Find something else that's fun. Well, just two or three times in a row and I can get those brownie recipes, right? I'll do that instead. That sounds like fun. That's cool. But if you love the repetition... You know, if you love the batting practice, if you love the speed bag, which is athletes have to love, the craftsmen have to love that as well. They have to love that repetition. And if they don't, they'll never become fluent in their craft, which is okay, unless they desperately want to get fluid in their craft. And that's a little bit of a shame. <clears throat> so <clears throat> how bad do you want it? <clears throat> And how kind are you willing to be to yourself to get there? Because if you beat yourself up over this, you'll never get there. Or if you get there, it won't be worth the trip. It'll have just been a brutal haul, which happens too. We, we suffer uh, for sometimes decades hoping to get something of value, a nest egg for our retirement, a college fund for our kids. And we get it, but we were miserable all the way along. 
that that's sometimes that's life that's survival strategy and sometimes we have to kind of buckle down and do things we don't want to do but in art it's particularly debilitating we're supposed to be spreading joy on some level not everybody you might love to do dystopian worlds or something like that but we'll assume the romantic view of things we're trying to put beauty into the world we're trying to have connection and joy in the world if we're miserable in our process How's that going to happen to the best of our ability? It's probably not. If we're miserable and can't stand what we do, all of our attempts are going to be a bloody mess. And we're not going to be happy through hardly any of it, which will all but destroy our creative potential, all but destroy our motivation, other than just, doggone it, I'm going to tough it out, kind of uh, stubborn uh, mule kind of attitude. Uh, in art, we can do better. If I can create a process that's connective, I can connect from the line to the tone, from the value to the color, from the simple to the complex, from the uh, basic to the realistic. If I can do that connective strategy, and if I can show beauty all the way along and learn to appreciate, be grateful for that beauty all the step of the way, Every single drawing I did, and you can do this too, I know it. There was at least one thing I could say something positive about. Every drawing your child ever showed you, there was at least one thing you could honestly tell her that was beautiful about that. Love the energy, love the bright, joyous colors. And you can do it without lying to her. You can do that for yourself. So, you know, I kind of like the eyebrow and then the, the actual hair of the eyebrow and then the eye socket of the anatomy. That's kind of cool. And I drew this and I drew it again. And I like the fact that I set the eye lid, kind of the stylized eyelid, back farther from the front of the eyebrow. This was a little too far forward. Not crazy about that. That was better. Good for me. This laying back of the ear is better than the, the more upright ear I did the time before. Good for me. It's a beautifully soft tone. I did a good job doing that little soft edge gradation. Good for me. Cherish those things. That's going to keep you coming back. Pat yourself on the back for your successes. Do it to other people so they'll do it for you. And be patient, be curious, and be kind. And there's no really no end of what you can do with your uh, with this thing called art, with our craft. All right, my friends. I will leave it there. For some reason, I'm not seeing the chat anymore. Oh, there it came back. Okay. Uh, hope that helps. Hope you guys have a beautifully safe weekend. You find a little beauty, whether it's in the sketchbook or out in the beautiful spring weather. And we'll see, I hope, next week. Take care.